we made a ton of new discoveries in 2023. Through a combination of talking to developers, translating foreign interviews into English for the first time, and working with data miners and archivists to dig up buried info on lost and forgotten games, including three unknown Retro Studios projects that died on the vine. And with so much trivia being unearthed, we wanted to highlight some of our favorite findings of the year in a more concise video. After all, a lot of folks don't have time to watch every video we put out, and some might miss the occasional episode. So without further delay and in no particular order, let's jump into Did You Know Gaming's biggest and best discoveries of 2023, starting with some love for Majora's Mask. For half of its development, Majora's Mask was gonna have an adult mask. The Hyrule Astoria shows concept art of adult Link, noting, only child Link appears in Majora's Mask, but for some reason, there are illustrations for adult Link. Hyrule Astoria's writers didn't know its purpose, but we found it after translating some old Japanese magazines. According to co-director Yoshiaki Koizumi, the mask was planned as a bonus feature. Adult Link would have just been a bonus feature, but art director Imamura pointed out that just turning into an adult wasn't very interesting, and it didn't make Link stronger or anything, so we decided not to include Adult Link this time. The Hyrule Astoria theorized these sketches were prototypes for Fierce Deity Link, but that's not the case. The true origin of the Fierce Deity Mask is a mask that turned Link into a gigantic Fierce Deity. But it was too OP, so the devs split up its abilities and made two less powerful masks from it. The Giant's Mask and the Fierce Deity Mask. In the final game, you can only use the Fierce Deity against bosses, and the Giant's Mask is only usable in Twin Mold's boss chamber. But this wasn't always so. Co-director Eiji Aonuma thought the masks should be wearable anywhere since all the others are. But then they'd have to add things like extra animation so Fierce Deity Link could duck under doorways he's too tall for, which would take time. And Miyamoto only gave them a year to make the game. These stories come from Japan's Nintendo Dream magazine. More specifically, the extra mini-mags included with the July, August, and September 2000 issues. They hold about a dozen pages of behind-the-scenes secrets and stories, details even Hyrule Astoria's writers didn't know. So we had them all translated and that's where most of this info comes from. In one issue, programmer Kenzo Hayakawa says, The position of most of the stars is determined by the player's name. When night falls, look for your own unique constellation. You could say every playthrough of Majora's Mask is personalized by what you name your save file. We did a test with two saves, one named Link and one named Zelda. Then we stood in the same spot looking at the same patch of sky in both, and saw that Link's sky has about twice as many stars as Zelda's. This detail wasn't known in the West until 2021 when a modder named Zell found it in the game's code. Now we all know. In another magazine, Miyamoto comments on the game's crunch, saying, This was one tough year, I assure you. As long as anything was finished, anything was acceptable. I made it clear that that's what was most important. At the start, the staff seemed pretty stressed out. They were like, there's no way we can make it in a year. Near the end of development, Miyamoto tried to ease the tension with small talk and what he calls naughty stories, but the Zelda team found him unbearable. Aonuma says he had to pull at least one all-nighter, and didn't even have time to play the game start to finish before it released. Majora's writers revealed that some of the NPCs are actually speaking for the developers. Scriptwriter Mitsuhiro Takano said, we put our feelings into the mouths of Termina's residents. We wrote one carpenter to say, Damn, I'll have to stay up again. I wonder if I'll finish this. And, damn, guess I'm staying up again tonight. I wonder if it will be ready in time. And after we completed development, I wrote the mask salesman to say, You've met with a terrible fate. In other words, the team felt they'd met with a terrible fate having to make a Zelda game under such crunch. Majora's Mask's story and tone are pretty different to past Zeldas, but one earlier Zelda game was also pretty unique, Link's Awakening. That game's weirdness was mostly thanks to Yoshiaki Koizumi, who's always kinda clashed with Miyamoto when it comes to storytelling. In one magazine, he says, I worked on the plot of Link's Awakening. I did the main story and Kensuke Tanabe wrote the side plots. I made quite a strange story and afterwards Miyamoto told me he'd never let me do it again. But I consider that a compliment. I had wanted to do something that wasn't at all Miyamoto-esque. For Ocarina of Time, Miyamoto only let him work on a few side quests, like the ones focused on Skull Kid and the Mask Shop. 
After Rock Arena, Koizumi started working on a non-Zelda game he said used certain systems to replay something over and over. The plan I had was a game that had a fixed time period of three days or a week or so, and the townspeople having fixed schedules they followed. It was while doing that that I went together with Miyamoto to America. The whole time he was complaining about how things weren't going well with Majora's development, and I was just like, oh yeah, that's too bad. <laughs> I was busy planning that other game. I was incredibly motivated, but then Miyamoto, his little whispers started calling to me, Zelda, 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 and before I knew it, my game was cancelled. Once we got to Japan, I had the entire situation explained to me, and I said I would join the Majora team, but only if I was allowed to do things my way. Koizumi would add many concepts from his canned game to Majora's Mask, a fixed three-day loop, townspeople living on a schedule, and so on. Besides Koizumi, another guy who greatly impacted Majora was Takia Imamura, probably best known as the creator of characters like Star Fox, Captain Falcon, and Tingle. Just like Koizumi, Imamura was brought in mid-development when the team were really struggling. Throughout these magazine interviews, Koizumi and Imamura made it clear they were pretty much forced to work on Zelda. Imamura was offered the job of art director. He tried to refuse but didn't have a choice, which turned out to be a blessing in disguise because the game wouldn't be the same without him. If you'd gone to the 1999 Space World trade show, you'd see the moon didn't have a face, not in the playable demo or even in the promotional art. That's because Imamura added the moon's face about two months before the game was finished and the moon's tear and most of the other moon-related content were created soon after. The moon's face was originally something he drew as a sketch, but Koizumi loved it and told him to give the moon a face that looked like Majora's mask, but Imamura ignored him and used his own judgment. Imamura says he originally drew the face of one of their superiors, but later changed it to the moon we know today. The inside of the moon was once more like a graveyard, it became a grassy hill, an idea they got from space battleship Yamato, a 1970s anime generally considered the granddaddy of Gundam and the entire space opera genre. Koizumi explained, With the world of Majora being so strange, the inside of the moon being like the planet Iskandar provides contrast by being ordinary. In a fairy tale world, it's a realistic world, or maybe I should say a picturesque world, that makes you feel the greatest sense of unease. In 2023, we also covered every cancelled Pokemon game. Well, at least the ones we could find, as well as a few lost games and failed pitches to boot. We got new info on pretty much every game we covered, but there were two projects we had a noteworthy role in bringing to light. The first of which is Pokemon Pinball DS. Pokemon Pinball for Game Boy was one of the earliest and most beloved spin-offs in the franchise, and its GBA sequel got review scores on par with the mainline games. But then the series just kinda died off. Unknown to the public though, a playable demo for a new entry on Nintendo DS was developed in secret. The Pokemon company said the game had the best graphics they'd ever seen outside Japan, but sadly, it was never finished. Fans became aware of the project thanks to a leak in 2021, where a spreadsheet saying Pokemon Pinball DS was planned to release around the same time as Diamond and Pearl, and that it was being developed by Fuse Games, the guys who made Mario Pinball Land and Metroid Prime Pinball. No other info was available, and Fuse shut down almost 15 years ago. But we managed to get in contact with artist Matthew Nightingale, one of the nine guys who worked on Pokemon Pinball DS. He told us it would have been more of an adventure game, similar to their take on Metroid. He believed the quality of Metroid Prime Pinball is what led Nintendo and the Pokemon Company to visit Fuse's UK offices and fund development of a playable demo with three stages. To help illustrate Matthew's description of the game, we commissioned artwork for all three stages. The first stage was Sinnoh's Countryside, a board where players journey from one city to the next. Pokémon appear as you traverse the route, like Diglett bumpers or Pikachu up a tree. You hit Pokémon with the pinball to stun it, then tap it with your finger to catch it. If you didn't click fast enough, it runs away. After a while, the city gates open so you can shoot the pinball through and reach the next table, the city stage. Catching Pokémon is simpler and faster than past games, so by the time you're through the countryside and city, you've collected enough Pokémon to form a team. Then it's time for the demo's final board where you fight a gym leader. The gym stage is double-ended. On one end, you have your flippers with a Pokémon between them, and on the other end is the gym leader's Pokémon. 
You power up attacks by hitting the ball to specific areas. Then with enough power, you can fire your ball into a hole, making your Pokémon attack. The table only has one ball, so if you lose control of it, the gym leader can nab it to charge their own attacks. Pokémon Pinball DS also would have had Wi-Fi multiplayer battles that played out just like gym battles. Matthew says the game also would have had an evolution mechanic, and probably would have come bundled with a GBA slot like Rumble Pack. Nintendo and the Pokémon Company were really impressed with the demo, but for some reason they never greenlit full production, so nothing got made beyond the playable demo. Matthew wasn't invited to any high-level meetings, but he suspects it came down to contract disputes. Pokémon Pinball games didn't exactly print money like the core series, so there wouldn't have been as much to go around for all parties involved. Fuse ended up going bankrupt in 2009, partly because Pokémon Pinball didn't go to market. We asked Matthew if it was lost to time after Fuse went belly up, but he said no. Nintendo paid to develop it, so they must still have it in their possession. The second game we had a hand in unearthing was Pokémon 2000 Adventure, a browser game that was lost media for decades. But we helped restore it and make it available online. More on that later. First, let's look at the game itself. Pokémon 2000 Adventure was an officially licensed title that ended up being better than Nintendo expected it'd be when they signed the contract, so they shut it down. But by then, a million people had already played it. This one's history is pretty unique. Pokémon's second movie, Pokémon The Movie 2000, was distributed by Warner Brothers in America. Along with the movie, Nintendo fully licensed and gave permission for WB to make promotional materials to sell more tickets. Nintendo probably expected posters, art, trailers, and maybe cheap web games like Pikachu Tic-Tac-Toe, but they weren't expecting Warner Brothers to spend millions producing a 3D Pokémon game. But that's exactly what WB did. They contracted a studio called Cyberworld, who'd made things like virtual shopping malls and a Harry Potter game. Think of them like Doom, 3D spaces full of 2D sprites, but running in a browser. Kinda impressive for the 90s. So WB wanted to use this cutting-edge tech to promote the new Pokémon movie. We talked to Eddie Ruminski, one of Cyberworld's developers who told us it was their most popular game to date. And that's when Nintendo freaked out and sent them a cease and desist. Nintendo thought Warner Brothers exceeded the contract's allowable scope, and didn't expect WB's promotion to include something that was legitimately a video game. Back then, the only 3D Pokémon games were Pokémon Snap and Stadium, so Nintendo thought fans would see this first-person adventure and think it was the series' new direction. They saw it as a threat, and feared it would cause brand confusion. Eddie was sort of a junior programmer at the time, but he was the only guy at Cyberworld familiar with Pokémon. The company got a pre-release VHS of Pokémon the Movie 2000, sat Eddie in front of it, and asked, How the hell do we turn this into a video game? After they bounced some ideas back and forth with Warner Brothers, here's what they came up with. Right now, you're watching one of our playthroughs of Pokémon 2000 Adventure, and you're hearing the game's soundtrack. The game opens with Professor Oak giving you the lowdown. Then, you pick one of the three Pokémon teams and a difficulty, and explore three islands in any order you want. Sometimes your path's blocked by environmental obstacles that require Pokémon's special abilities to get past, like these volcanic lava plumes. We used Poliwhirl's water gun to extinguish the flames. Then he got XP and evolved into Poliwrath. Eventually, we found Moltres. It asked us a trivia question about Lavender Town, and after we got it right, Moltres gave us the Red Ancient Sphere. Then on the next island, we used Lapras to freeze a lake and cross it, melted an ice barrier with Vulpix, and answered Articuno's trivia question to get another sphere. On the final island, we cleared some electric barriers and evolved a couple more Pokémon, and got the final sphere from Zapdos. Then Oak thanked us for saving the world and gave us a certificate for beating the game. The game's only about 10 minutes, but there's replayability thanks to the three Pokémon teams and difficulty settings. By the time Nintendo struck down the game, the devs had been paid, they got to see the movie before it hit theaters, and they got to say they worked on a massively successful Pokémon game. It was the greatest compliment via cease and desist, saying, Sorry, what you made was too much like a good video game. At the end of the day, when it was pulled, it was like, We've already been paid! That was a $2 million deal to make that game. Once it was pulled, it was like, we did the work. It was really popular. We hit the million downloads that we, like, didn't even dream of to begin with. So when it was pulled, we were all happy. 
Warner Brothers was happy too. A million downloads got them more promotion than expected, and Pokemon 2000 went on to become the second highest grossing Japanese movie to ever hit American theaters. So everyone was happy except Nintendo. Eddie held on to the raw files for 23 years. Then after he saw our video about restoring Pokemon Garden, he reached out and sent us the files. One of the Garden archivists, Rufus Ten, and his friend Doomtay did some wizardry to get it working again, which was a lot harder than it sounds. All credit goes to those guys. And for preservation's sake, we also archived the game's concept art, storyboards, soundtrack, and all the raw files. If you want to play the game yourself or check out those files, there's a link in the description. Moving on. Last year, we documented a few scrapped games that had never been seen before, and uncovered new details on cancelled games we barely knew anything about. And we were fortunate enough to be able to do that again this year. For this next segment, we're going to highlight a few scrapped games we uncovered from Retro Studios. First up, we're looking at a prototype game described by its developers as Portal with Combat. Just after they'd finished Metroid Prime 3, Retro created a prototype for a Portal-like game called Adept that had never been seen or even heard of publicly until we unearthed it. The footage you're seeing is an early proof of concept running in the Prime 3 engine, and that's why you aren't seeing tons of polish. Its purpose was to illustrate mechanics, and it was more of a playable pitch that Nintendo said no to than a fully-fledged big-budget game. This was late 2007 into early 2008, when Retro was putting together the Prime Trilogy collection and trying to figure out what their next big project would be. Portal had just come out, and Adept was going to take Portal's general premise and evolve it. Instead of portals, Adept used cylinders. There's teleportation cylinders, but instead of just two like in Portal, you can make as many as you want. Another type is force cylinders, which push anything that goes inside upwards. They're mostly used for jumping, but you can attach them to ceilings to push downward or on walls to push sideways. In this clip, you magnetize yourself to attract a healing item, and here an enemy is about to throw projectiles at you, but you hit him with an attract, so all the projectiles are sucked back and kill him. There's also fire cylinders that melt ice or light things on fire. Careful though, because they can do the same to you. Ice cylinders are pretty similar. Useful for freezing objects, putting out flames, and killing enemies. Enemies can't see your cylinders, but you can make an infinite number to kill them, solve puzzles, and so on. Adept's prototype was made by one guy, Prime 2 and 3 programmer Paul Tozer, who eventually got enough excitement internally at Retro to present it to the whole company, and eventually Nintendo's higher-ups. This footage was presented to the Nintendo producer who oversaw Retro's projects, Kensuke Tanabe, but it didn't click with him. Retro's handlers at Nintendo didn't seem to know what Portal was, and didn't really play games made outside Nintendo. Here's Paul. Nintendo Japan is very insular and there is very much a not invented here syndrome. And mm. I think a lot of that comes from the fact that they do have these extraordinary design skills. They, they've all trained under Miyamoto-san. And in fact, at one point, I bought a copy of Portal, tried to give it to Kensuke Tanabe, you know, tried to explain to them, I'm going to pitch you this game concept, but could you please take a look at this because it's amazing and it'll help you understand what I'm going to pitch. And they basically said, we can't accept gifts. Sorry company policy. It was not intended uh, as a gift. It was intended as, I'm letting you borrow this so that you can see a game that has really incredible design. Paul blamed himself for Adept's failure to launch. As the designer, it was his responsibility to sell the concept. The pitch version also had an overly complicated UI that Paul later wished he removed for simplicity. After Tanabe said no, Retro Management told Paul he could keep working on Adept, but only if it became a Nintendo DS game. But Paul didn't think it would work on DS, so the whole thing fizzled out. After Prime 3, a few devs started working on the Trilogy Collection for Wii. Meanwhile, three other games were being prototyped in a playable form including Adept and our next unearthed game, The Blob Game. This was an unfinished DS project but unfortunately we don't have any footage of it, so we'll show you other games that seem similar. The Blob Game was a physics-based 2D puzzler where you play as a sticky blob. You'd use the touch screen to stretch the blob in one direction, then let go and it'd fling in the opposite direction. We talked to 3X devs with one saying, quote, the project was pretty far along when it was shelved, including tooling being in place and a pitch to attach booze from the Mario IP. 
Some concept art leaked back in 2020 for a game with booze from Mario, but till now, fans didn't know what the gameplay would have been or if it was ever playable. According to retro artist Sammy Hall, the game would have taken us to quote, very, very unfamiliar territory. Deep in debt at Haunt University, powers and abilities, broomies, possession powers, and a spider boss. Oftentimes the way development works is gameplay is cooked up first, then an existing IP is attached to it later. From what we were told, it seems the Blob gameplay existed as the prototype, and all the Mario-related stuff was only in the artwork and pitch documents. Everyone at Retro really liked the Blob game and thought it had potential, but Nintendo's response to the pitch was that there were, quote, a lot of teams who could build that title, and they didn't want Retro spending their valuable time on that kind of project. The game was killed off, but the tooling from its development eventually made its way into Donkey Kong Country Returns. In 2013, an internal pitch at Retro Studios proposed that after Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, their next project should be Star Fox. Unfortunately, it was shot down by Retro's leadership, and the project was never known publicly until we made a video on it. The game would have been called Star Fox Armada, and was dreamt up by Eric Kozlowski, a former retro artist who worked on games like Uncharted and Mass Effect. Eric gave us a full 12-page pitch document on the game and told us all about it. The game was aimed at Wii U, with an art style that emulated the puppet aesthetic from the series' earlier promo images. Retro sorta had a knack for rebooting Nintendo franchises, like Metroid and DK, and Eric wanted the studio to take a crack at Star Fox, too. Star Fox has taken a lot of forms over the years, but the series peaked both critically and commercially with Star Fox 64. So Armada was gonna pick up where 64 left off, both in terms of story and gameplay. According to the pitch, Armada would essentially reboot the series as if no games had been made since 64. After Andross's defeat, General Pepper realizes that Corneria and the Lilat system need to be rebuilt, but the war left the Cornerian government lacking the resources it needed to rebuild its military and civilian sectors. So the remaining forces stay back to defend the Lilat system, and Star Fox is hired to search nearby systems for allies and resources. But along the way, Fox and company will discover a threat far greater than Andross ever was. As far as gameplay is concerned, Armada would have combined the gameplay of Star Fox 64, i.e. Fox would keep his butt in a vehicle at all times, with new open world and multiplayer mechanics. In single player, players accept missions aboard the Great Fox and travel to planets, sectors, installations, and asteroid belts to complete them. And the mission's spoils, both cash and resources, can either be sent back to Corneria or used to upgrade your ships or buy new ones like the Landmaster tank and Blue Marine submarine. Armada was also going to have optional side quests that leaned more into the mercenary angle. Star Fox have always been mercenaries, but past games didn't really focus on that detail. Overall, Armada would have had less of a linear structure like the old games, and expanded into more of a mission-based structure. Fox never gets out of his ship in missions, but he could walk about the Great Fox. Eric compared it to how the Normandy works in Mass Effect, where you can select missions, interact with the crew, and purchase upgrades. The main gameplay would take place on a TV, while the Wii U gamepad acted as the ship's control panel showing data about the current mission, and which parts of your ship had taken damage. If a wing or something's taken too many hits, the player needs to tap icons on the gamepad to repair it in real time, so you wouldn't have to constantly look down to aim like in Star Fox Zero. If you want to play co-op, player one would use a Wii remote and nunchuck, and player two would use the gamepad, serving as the ship's gunner with a 360-degree view. They'd handle repairs and control the ship's shields. If a bunch of enemies fly in from the left, player two could move the shields to that side and gun in that direction. But if this wasn't up your alley, you could play online with one friend or a group to complete missions in multiple ships. There also would have been a mode where you can have dogfights with friends like in Star Fox 64's Versus mode, but online instead of just split-screen. The reason the game was called Armada is because it encourages you to build up your own squadron. You and your friends can make your own team and call it Star Hawk, Star Snakes, Star Dogs, whatever you want, and even design your own anthropomorphic characters if you didn't want to be Fox and Company. In Star Fox 64, sometimes Star Wolf would show up and attack in the middle of a mission. That would also happen in Armada, but it'd be other online players dropping down on you. Folks who just want a single-player experience could turn this off, 
But for everyone else, enemy mercenaries pouncing on you is something that had happened from time to time. Eric hoped that players could use the Wii U's Miiverse to put bounties on other teams. Like if a team called Star Llama messed you up mid-mission, you could hop on Miiverse and put a 500 credit bounty on their heads. Star Fox games haven't sold well since N64, so this pitch had to sell management on it. All the online features were a main selling point to keep fans playing after the main campaign. The pitch doc calls it an evergreen title and mentions DLC intended to bring fans back for more by adding new ships, missions, and planets over time. Nintendo didn't have any evergreen titles in 2013, but Splatoon sort of filled that niche a couple years later, and it's been incredibly successful ever since. So why didn't Star Fox Armada ever get made? Eric pitched the doc to Retro Leadership in January 2013. They basically said, oh cool, then passed on it, and it doesn't appear it ever made its way up the chain to Nintendo. Eric ended up resigning from Retro a year and a half later, partly because of the studio's top-down nature. Other studios he's worked at had cultures that were more open, where pitches stood a chance of being turned into actual games. When we talked to Eric, he emphasized this was a skeleton of a document, which would have needed flushing out from all the brilliant people at Retro. Unfortunately though, internal pitches just never got approved at the studio, and other former Retro employees told us the same. As of this video's publication, Retro Studios hasn't released a single game since Tropical Freeze back in 2014. So after rejecting the Star Fox Armada pitch, what did they work on instead? Eric wouldn't say. After Tropical Freeze, Eric spent a year and a half working on a game that was never released. And that's all he was willing to say. Whatever Retro was making, it's still considered top secret. Nintendo later teamed up with Platinum Games to make Star Fox Zero, which unfortunately ended up as the worst-selling game in the entire franchise. And there hasn't been another Star Fox game since. Fans are still waiting for the day Fox will make his return. Whether it's a reboot from Retro or maybe in-house at Nintendo, hopefully that day isn't too far off. Now we're going to talk about two scrapped Sonic games we got new info on, Sister Sonic and Sonic Chronicles 2. Well, our Sister Sonic coverage is more like us setting the record straight and debunking rumors, but it's a pretty interesting scrap project. Back in 1991, Japanese studio Nihon Falcom released a side-scrolling action RPG starring a female bounty hunter called Popful Male for the PC-88. A few years later, rumors spread that Sega wanted to localize a Sega CD version for America and replace Mail with Sonic's long-lost sister. But not a single screenshot has ever been seen. And if you go looking for proof that Sister Sonic ever existed, the only citations are from Electronic Gaming Monthly's rumor section. The rumor was that Sister Sonic would be at an upcoming toy fair. But that never happened. In fact, it was never shown anywhere at all. EGM's gossip was unsighted, with no reference to press releases, dev quotes, or even anonymous sources. To make sure the game was even real, we poured through old Japanese magazines, and eventually found sources proving Sister Sonic did exist. But the rumors were only half true. In Beep Mega Drive Magazine's November 1992 issue, the director of Sega Falcom announced five games in development. One of them was Sister Sonic, and it wasn't just a reskin. Sister Sonic would be a full-on remake. Before we go on, keep in mind Popful Mail was originally developed by Nihon Falcom, and Sega Falcom was a joint venture to bring Nihon's PC games to Sega consoles. So in the magazine, director Kazutaka Yano says that Sega Falcom doesn't just port Nihon Falcom titles, they reinterpret them in their own way. And this is where he mentions that Sister Sonic is a remake, and that the character is like a female relative of the Sonic family. He also says the game's Sonic rebrand was just because Sonic's already popular around the world. Further down the page it says, Sister Sonic is an action RPG based on Popful Mail, starring the first female Sonic character Sister Sonic as the main character. The protagonist being a bounty hunter hasn't changed, but Sister Sonic isn't a cute character like Mail. She's a more mature girl. Expect her to have a flirtatious and sexy charm. It'll release in Japan and overseas at nearly the same time with Japanese subtitles. So let's clear up some misinformation that spread from EGM. First off, Sister Sonic wasn't an American localization of Popful Mail. It was a remake releasing worldwide, including Japan. Second, Sister Sonic wasn't Sonic's sister. She was a sexy relative. And third, 
Sega never tried passing the game off as an original work, and never hid its popful male origins. Actually, if they tried to pass it off as an original game, it might not have been canned. We bought this book from Japan. It says when popful male fans heard their favorite game was being turned into Sonic, they started a mail-in campaign asking Sega to faithfully port popful mail to Sega CD. They must have sent a ton of letters because Sega rolled over and did exactly that. Popful Mail for Sega CD released in Japan in 1994 and in America a year later. But even without Sonic, it was still a remake. Look at the PC-88 original next to the Sega CD version. It's almost unrecognizable. And with Sister Sonic canned, only one Sonic RPG ever released in the series' 30-year history. And there might have been a whole series of RPGs if it wasn't for one man. Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood was a Nintendo DS game developed by BioWare, the same studio behind Knights of the Old Republic and Mass Effect. Sonic Chronicles ended on a cliffhanger, and BioWare said they had a precise idea for what had happened in the sequel, but unfortunately a sequel never got made. So we reached out to Chronicles lead designer Miles Holmes to get some answers. And for context, here's the first game's plot, heavily summarized. Thousands of years ago, there were two warring echidna kingdoms, the Knuckles clan and the Nocturnus clan. These bitter rivals all went extinct, except for one last echidna called Knuckles. As the last of his bloodline, he lives in solitude guarding the Master Emerald. At the start of Chronicles 1, Knuckles is kidnapped by some unknown warriors. Sonic and friends rescue him and discover the warriors were part of the Nocturnus tribe, including a female called Shade. Knuckles is shocked because he thought he was the last surviving Echidna, but apparently no. The remaining Nocturnus have been imprisoned in another dimension called the Twilight Cage for thousands of years. The mysterious god Argus locked them in there, along with a bunch of alien races from other planets, though no one knows why. Shade's squad came to Earth to steal the Master Emerald and use its power to free the rest of their tribe. But later, it turns out the Nocturnus' chief, a guy called Ix, has a secret evil plan. This surprises Shade, who wants no part in a war of aggression, so she joins up with Team Sonic. Ix takes the Master Emerald and warps back to the Twilight Cage. Our heroes chase after him, yada yada yada, Super Sonic defeats Ix, and the rest of the Nocturnus are left to rot in the Twilight Cage. Team Sonic heads home victorious, but realized time had been flowing slower in the Twilight Dimension while they were gone. It was just a few hours to them, but several years passed back on Earth. And with no one to stop him, Eggman took over the world. And the game ends there, on a cliffhanger. And here's how it would have continued in the sequel, straight from Sonic Chronicles lead designer Miles Holmes. Picking it up from the cliffhanger, they come back and it's and it's now Eggman's world, right? Um, so that's a little bit the the Back to the Future 2 kind of vibe. We talked about like like uh, Skynet in Terminator 2, you know, the, when you get to see the future, when you get to see what Kyle Reese is, is from, it's like, but it's now it's all Eggman stuff, you know? So in this case, it's Eggman has, is basically unchecked by Sonic has been able to do what he's always wanted to do, right? Take over and and remake the world in his image. So a lot of the, the population has been rounded up in their prisoners or their slaves or whatever. and uh, you've got machines, Eggman's machines are, you know, this very dystopic kind of uh, Terminator future. So part of that would have been the fun of being able to go to, you know, famous world landmarks and seeing them remade in this Eggman style. So, you know, like an, having going to Paris and seeing like Eggman's gear all over the Eiffel Tower, sort of watching down with a big eye or something like that. When Sonic and company return to Eggman's Earth, their ship crashes and everyone's scattered to the winds. So the player is following multiple parties and populating them in different locations. Always on the run, always fighting to see another day. Eventually, they're able to free some populations and start to build a multinational army to storm Eggman's base and restore world order. Just as they're about to do exactly that, Argus shows up. The Mega God alluded to in the first game, but even Super Sonic's not strong enough to beat Argus. So in spite of everything, Sonic and Eggman join forces to take him down. Eggman uses his Mega Death Laser to fire Super Sonic out like a bullet to break through Argus' defenses, ending the first boss phase. With Argus weakened, the Twilight Cage opens, and everyone who was trapped inside is set free and joins in a massive climactic battle to finish off Argus. So Knuckles has freed his fellow Echidnas and everyone else in the cage, and with Shade he can potentially continue his bloodline. Eggman runs off yelling until next time Sonic, and so the status quo returns. The end. Well, except for the final teaser. 
The first game says the Twilight Cage is a pocket dimension where the Nocturnus and other alien races are imprisoned, but you never know why. The truth would have been revealed in the sequel. Long ago, an oracle told Argus that someday he'd die at the hands of a mortal. So to prevent his own death, Argus swept the universe imprisoning any race that may be a threat. But the final teaser would reveal the oracle's prediction was actually a trick. Argus was unknowingly building a super team that could destroy him. And beyond that, with the oracle being able to take down something as powerful as Argus, even if indirectly, they're dangerous. And a dangerous, mysterious being like that is something any writer can work with if they wanted to continue the series. At least that's what BioWare seemed to be going for. BioWare considered their work finished with this duology, but hoped another studio or Sega themselves would continue Chronicles as a series. So why didn't Chronicles 2 get made? The first game sold well and reviews weren't too bad. Chronicles was basically free money and brand exposure for Sega, and Sonic Team even told BioWare they wanted to use Shade and Argus in their own games. And the BioWare guys were thrilled to hear it. Well, long story short, tons of Sonic comics from 1994 to 2006 were authored by a man named Ken Penders. And in Ken's view, the comic characters he created belonged to him, not Sega and Chronicles' characters took inspiration from them. Two months after Chronicles launched, Ken started copywriting all his creations. Then a series of lawsuits kicked off between Ken, Sega, Bioware, and the comic publisher. If you want the full explanation, go watch our video on Lost Sonic games, but yeah, a whole mess of legal issues triggered by Ken Penders is why Chronicles 2 never got made. Don't forget to check out our new game. Pre-orders are available right now. And if you want more Did You Know Gaming videos like this one, make sure you subscribe. Thanks for watching. See you next time.